what's up everybody? Welcome back to another episode of BS for Build. We're here working on my Lamborghini Murcielago. Oh my gosh, there's some stuff there that we didn't mean to show you. Oscar, quick, remove the stuff. All right, uh, we're all good. In the last episode, we found out that we can tragically not take the body off of my Lamborghini Murcielago and put it on a Tesla Model 3. Ain't happening. Good news is, in the last, last episode, we found out that this thing actually fires up and runs. So the last thing that we need to do to seal the deal on keeping the powertrain of this Lamborghini Murcielago is gonna be to test out that the transmission works. So the game plan in today's episode, Test out the transmission works. If it does, that's a slam dunk. We keep the powertrain. Then we gotta figure out all the other stuff that we're gonna need to buy, source, find, fabricate to be able to make this thing actually run and drive because I don't know if you guys know this, but the back ain't really attached to the back very much in this thing. And then we gotta come up with a game plan for cosmetically how to repair this thing and what it shall look like. That's what's in store in today's episode. Let's get down to it. In the last episode, you guys saw us gut out the interior. Uh, that needed to be done anyways. And worth keeping in mind, we didn't cut anything. We didn't break anything. This car, oddly enough, doesn't have a lot of plastic push tab things that just all snap when you take them apart. So we're in really good standing. There's a few electronical things that we need to plug back into the car to hopefully get it to fire up. And we've got a few of those right here. This is a thing that's got a lot of light stuff and then an R, which I think means reverse. Yeah, by the way, I've never driven a Murcielago before in my life, so I don't know what a lot of these things do. I'm pretty sure this is how you go into reverse. I'm pretty sure this is how you switch gears, forwards and backwards, and then, where's park? Don't park <laughs> you just go. There's no park. There's zero chill. All right, we might have to watch a YouTube video about the functionality of a Mercy Lago before we try and test that stuff out. But uh, we think we've got all of the electronical things that need to be plugged in here to get the car to fire back up. So let's just real quickly plug them back in, apply power to the car, and see where we stand. I think we're going to be standing right here, but with the car. We're plugged back in. So it's four parts. We've got our reverse button and light button assortment here. Such a bizarre design. The design on this car is so bad. I wonder if I could do an epic thing and move this all the way over there. Like, what do you think you're gonna hit more that should be right next to your hand? Is it gonna be the flap up down button, the traction control button, the gas thing, the fold your mirrors in? I don't know what that one is. Or, you know, reverse, that they'll put it like pretty much as far away from you as they can. So bizarre. Anyways, that's plugged in. Dashboard is plugged back in. And those two guys right there are plugged back in. We believe that is all the electronics that we have unplugged from the interior of this car. So uh, we have power to the battery. Last time we checked, there was some juice left in it. We're gonna go ahead and flip this kill switch right here. Ding. It's oddly quiet. Keys in. Very quiet. Oscar, you wanna, I don't know, maybe we unplug the battery? Well, we either completely broke the car or we're completely out of power. Gotta figure this problem out. Before we get too far into it, I want to take a second out to thank our sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by the Anchor Solex C1000 Portable Power Station. This thing is super, super cool. I've had it for over a month now. I've been testing it out over the holidays, and I gotta say, it's the coolest new piece of tech that I have seen all year. I absolutely love it. You can see on the front here, it's got a lot of different ports. You've got standard wall outlet, like 110 style wall outlets. You've got USB-C, USB, car socket. It's got a built-in light with a few settings, and it stores a ton of power. But not only does it have a lot of power, it can recharge itself very, very fast. It can recharge back to 100% in just 58 minutes when AC recharging. And if you're running a solar input, like 600 watt solar array, this thing will charge in 1.8 hours. Now, both of those numbers are just like a lot faster than the competitors. <laughs> And like I mentioned, it's got 11 different ports with a 1,056 watt hour capacity inside here. 1,800 watts output with a surge output of 2,400 watts when you use the surge pad. That's this guy right here. And if I'm correct, I think that means we can do this. Just 
grab a welder here for testing. I don't want to get welds better on my new power station, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna move these. This is incredible. You guys aren't gonna believe this. We're still at 100%. Oscar, we've got a portable welder now. This is incredible. I can't believe it. I just fully welded out this bracket using only the power coming out of the C1000. That, that's a game changer. And not a terrible weld if I do say so myself. As you can see, it's very small, very portable, easy to move around. It's 15% smaller than the industry average. The batteries inside this will last a very long time. They have a 10 year lifespan and 3000 charge cycles. You can also use it as a UPS, uninterruptible power supply. It's got uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi connectivity. So I can, they have an amazing app you can use on your phone to monitor the status of your power station and you can even control it and do fun things like turn on the light remotely and with this port right here on the back it has expandable capacity so anchor has more batteries that you can plug into this and expand up to 2112 watt hours now i've never had any issue with just the 1000 ish 1000 and change but i love this thing so much i really i do want the 2000 watt i want the add-on i don't think i need it but i want it it's an amazing product, right? That's all I can say is it's a really amazing product. Guys, the Anchor Solex C1000 Portable Power Station is available now. You can learn more information about it by clicking the link in my description. This is a great opportunity to get somebody close to you the coolest Christmas gift ever. This makes fishing trips. Uh, well, you can now, I, I've tested it, you can now brew a cup of coffee, fresh coffee, while you're out fishing. Technology is great, isn't it? Huge thanks to Anchor Solex for sponsoring this episode. Let's get back to it. Well, we think we solved the no power issue by replacing the battery. The battery was reading three volts, so we must have left the old battery on. The battery is down there in front of the rear wheel, if anybody's wondering. Uh, so Oscar's gonna go ahead and flip that kill switch and we should see a little bit of action. Action! You get anything? No, I, I heard something. Okay, so we try the key now? Yeah, that's some action. It's mad, it's real mad, and the dash is not on at all. Oh, that. Didn't do that sound last time either. I don't know, but we got no power to the dash. I think that's gonna be the next thing we gotta figure out. It's gotta be this way. Just... Oh, that's not even plugged in. Very bad. likely the problem. All right, let's, um, let's um, should we power, should we kill switch the car before we plug that back in? This dash is my favorite part of the car. Yeah, look at those Christmas lights. Super cool. I think all the beeping is to tell us your door is open. Your, your front door, your side door, and your back door are ajar. So now that we believe we got the electronics back in order, we, we want to do a trans test, but the other thing that would be good to do on this car is just run the engine for a little bit longer than we did last time. Last time we ran the engine for a little bit and then this happened. It works, it works. It's a big screech and it's most likely just something in the accessory system, but we got to figure out what that was. So we're going to, we're setting up to run the engine for a little bit longer. The way that we're going to do that is by adding coolant. That was the only part of this engine system, as far as we know, that is broken. So here's one radiator and that's what they're supposed to look like. It's radiator right here, hose coming off of here, fan right there. This corner, obviously a little bit more bare, but we have the inlet and the outlet hose for the radiator. We're going to um, clear the, the fluid system for the radiator and that's what we're going to check on first so we can then loop this thing and fill the coolant system and that will allow us to run the engine much much longer potentially really long but since these guys were open when I got the vehicle I'm a little bit worried about what type of stuff might be in here and going through the uh, coolant system so there are some drain plugs on the bottom we're gonna go find those open them up and see if anything comes out that way we can inspect it if not we're gonna start flushing stuff through here and cleaning it out we immediately found out something interesting about the drivetrain. Interestingly catastrophic, and we'll talk to you guys about that later, but we're just gonna keep moving forward, trying to make sure that everything works, because hey, if the trans doesn't work, maybe that's not a problem anyways. We, uh, I was accidentally looking at a Lamborghini Gallardo form, and that's the one that has the drain tubes closer to the middle, but since we got the big boy engine, um, we believe, we looked all over the car, it looks like each radiator has a drain plug on the bottom of it, Wow, that's really dark. Let me do cameraing. Ta-da! Drain plug. We're gonna drain a little bit of fluid out of this and double check that it looks good. Other than that, there's not a lot we can do other than flush. Flush and flush and more flush. So let's get going. Okay, real quick, coolant looks great. So we're gonna add coolant, maybe flush a little bit of coolant. 
It's kind of hard because the questionable side is the one that doesn't even have a radiator. So we'll run some water through the system. Really a lot of what we're trying to do is make sure that there isn't any big giant debris in the system, which we've already ran this car. So it kind of would have ran through. And then the other thing is we want to keep the water pump um, wet because if you run them really dry, it can damage them. It doesn't often damage them, but everything's so expensive on this car, we don't want to risk it. So we'll get some fluids in there. All right, we flushed the system with great results. Clean fluids coming out, clean fluids going in. Very happy about that, actually, but kind of surprisingly. And then we closed the loop on the system, so um, now the water can flow through there and it will do what we wanted, which is really just make sure we're hydrating that water pump. So I wanna show you this before we try and fire this thing up and, and test gears. That is the rear axle for the passenger side. It does, it's not in the wheel hub. All that stuff was totaled in the wreck and then we kind of bodged it together real quick so we could get it on a, on and off of a tow truck. So um, if we get it in a drive, that thing's gonna be clanging. On the other side though, we will see the wheel move um, because that one is attached. There are no brakes on this vehicle, so once they start moving forward, they're gonna go. Now this is an e-gear, so it's a computer controlled clutch. So yeah, it probably won't be pretty. It's probably not gonna be, this, this might be slightly violent and we have no brakes to slow down anything or ease it. But um, yeah, we're gonna try and first gear, get the wheels to go forward, and then um, we'll use our super cool reverse button to hopefully get them to go into reverse verifying that the transmission at least works a little bit. And then we'll probably, actually before any of that, I got ahead of myself a little bit, we'll listen to the engine run a little bit and make sure it doesn't start squeaking and squealing at us anymore. All of the lights. Feeling good? Yep. All right. Fire. So I've got a check engine light, and when I go to hit first gear, it just beeps back at me. It doesn't matter if the brakes are on, off. Check engine light is definitely something we need to inspect next. Um, the idling, the, the idling will not go down. We are now into Lamborghinis doing Lamborghini stuff, which is a dangerous place to be tiptoeing around when you're Mr. B is for build. Harbor Freight sell Lamborghini diagnostic tools? Oh, not yet. Okay. Oscar and I jumped into some code scanners. Uh, funny enough, our Autel sent us this years ago and it's kind of our most high-tech scanner that we got, embarrassingly enough, and uh, it couldn't connect to the vehicle. So we used the, this might be 10 year old Cantec OBD2 scanner from Harbor Freight. Got manufacturer control. This one is an interesting throttle pedal position uh, switch range performance. So that's saying like the signal from the throttle is a little out of range. Then manufacturer control, we have no idea what those two manufacturer controls are. And then um, idle air control system RPM higher than expected. And we are idling higher than I would like to. So that is very interesting, but uh, we cleared those codes and then we fired up the car again and they have not came back as of yet. So our, the way that we tend to do like with that stuff is after a car's been salvaged and you don't really know the state of anything is if you clear the codes and they just aren't coming back, don't worry about it until maybe they come back. If they come back, then we're gonna start hunting into things and in which is most likely gonna be a throttle body issue. But no point in wasting time if you don't know if you have an issue. So uh, we moved on to, let's try and figure out how to get it in gear. When I hit the paddles, I don't know if you guys could hear, when I hit the paddles, it just beeps at us. So I called my friend, Ed Bullion. He is like the Murcielago guru. He's my most knowledgeable Lamborghini knowledge friend. And he let me know that there is a position sensor on the brake pedal that is a common point of failure. I can't see it from in here, but um, there's a, a position sensor is normally just a little thing that's got a little, it's got a little pressure switch on it. And as you push down the brake pedal, that pressure switch will get to a fully extracted point. And then it will say, okay, that means you have your brakes on. And then if you have your brakes on, he says, you know, the taillights will come on because they're also triggered off of that. Um, so he's saying, if you see your taillight on at that point, the vehicle should think that the brake pedal is on and it should allow you to switch into gear. So 
Let's go ahead and put the tail light back in and we'll turn the car on and see if we can get the tail lights to come on. If not, let's see if we can hack the car into getting the tail lights to come on. I'll get the I'll get the kill switch. Tail light is in. This is how we apply our power race car stuff. Can you hear it doing things. So Ed just told us that pump that we're hearing. Oh yeah. Can hear it just very. It's very very. Uh, it's like you're no cheating, Oscar. No cheating. We're not ready yet. The key's up here. We might need the key. Um, that pump is, I believe, what's called an F1 pump, and that char that that primes the pressure for the E gear probably to switch gears with a computer brain. So go ahead and hit the brake pedal with just your foot. Okay, tail light is coming on. Okay, so that's that's that. The next the next thing would be to start the car and then try it. Now, because this might break stuff, do you want me to do it instead of you? Would you feel more comfortable if I do it or are you? I don't want to break any lane B parts now. Okay, I'll do, I'll do it. It's, <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> you can film that drive shaft back there that might flail out of control and break stuff. <laughs> You guys let me know. I know Chris Fix has shirts. So should we have a Chris Break shirt? Chris Breaks? Who's calling me? Hey, Engineering Explain is calling. Hi, Jason. I'm going to hang up on you. Sorry, I'm busy. Doing Lambo things with my friends. So the car would not go, will not currently go into first gear or reverse. Um, we did get the brake lights to come on when we hit the brakes. So that's, you know, got through step one. Now we're into step two. And then, so this is, okay, I gotta say, this is kind of fun. It's kind of cool because it's bringing me back to a long time ago, the days of troubleshooting a lot of builds that we have just no knowledge of and stuff like that. So the challenge is there and that is fun. I guess I just, it's like I'm playing poker with too big of a bankroll. Like I'm gambling with a little bit too much here that kind of takes the fun out of it is honestly how this feels a little bit. So I'm reading on Lamborghini forums about other people that, you know, and also there's not a lot of documentation and troubleshooting written down about these cars because they're done in such few numbers. But anyways, good news. Read through the forums, learned a lot about troubleshooting the transmission, the e-gear and all of this stuff to find on the very, very last one, 64 posts in. I'm glad I scrolled all the way through that form and I know all you guys out there have been in the same position too where you're scrolling through forums hoping to find the answer and somebody just simply stated, the car will not go into reverse or neutral if it thinks the hood or the bonnet, the frunk or the trunk are uh, open. There will be a red exclamation point on the dash. And sure enough, we have a red exclamation point on the dash. There's a few things on that dash. We don't know what they mean. So now we think we, uh, we have a starting point. So let's talk about what we do to fix that when you don't have a, um, a frunk. You get an Oscar with a screwdriver. <laughs> now let's see, where's the sensor here? Okay, so two wires are gonna be leading to a sensor right here. This little guy right here is definitely the sensor. You can actually hear it clicking. And um, that's telling the, the car if the frunk is open or closed. Oscar's got the right idea. The easiest way to do this is you want to go ahead and give it the jammy. Man, that thing seems a little broken, yeah, it does doesn't it? Right. it? It's good, though. And it's not coming back up, so I guess it was just oddly easy for me to shut with my finger. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a needs-to-be-fixed type thing. Okay, so that's the frunk. And then we'll go look for something similar in the back because it says both the... God, what is it? So there's a hood, there's a bonnet, and a, what's the, what's the British word for a trunk? No, boot. The bonnet and the boot. Here's the, here's the mechanism, here's the sensor, here's the little clicky clicky guy. Um, so uh, luckily they kept it, kept it similar on both of these. It's still plugged in, so go ahead and just give it the beans. We're learning about this whole beans quote now. There we go. Okay, so now the car should be much happier. We'll go ahead and um, get our ventilation going again, fire it up, and make some racket. Oh, 
turned the backs. I couldn't see anything. Something started taking off on me. The rev started climbing. <laughs> um, that's strange. Well, it is going into gears. It's probably not super happy with the car being in the air. It's not giving any resistance to the transmission. I mean, it is trying to like electronically slip a gear, slip a clutch. Don't slip a gear. That would be expensive. So what do you think, Oscar? Do we call that transmission working? Is that like enough? <laughs> I mean, I think it works, right? Yeah. You said the front wheel moved a little bit. When you put it in reverse, the front wheel moved a lot. And oh. It turned like a half a turn, maybe. And then the back one moved like a quarter a turn when you would put it in gear. Oh, when I gave it a little throttle? No, we just put it in gear. Hmm. Okay. It's doing stuff. It's bumping stuff around. Our check engine light has came back. And we did a little bit more uh, diagnosing. So you can read the codes in the code number with um, just a cheap scanner. And then you gotta kind of Google which each code means. And they're all throttle related. Throttle body, throttle position. It's, it's why the car is idling way too high. It's idling at about 1200 RPMs and it won't drop down below that. So um, we're gonna go ahead and pop off the, um, the hoses on the, on the outside of the, each one of the throttle bodies and see if we can look at it. It's cylinder six, I think, that's really causing the problem. We're just gonna see if maybe we got a dead throttle body or something like that, or something that's stuck. See if we can actuate these things uh, and visually inspect them. After getting these tubes off, we can see a lot of, uh, of corrosion, a lot of um, just gunk and crap in here. Now, this was not a flood car, so um, there should not have been any water that got in here at all, um, but it's just not looking good. These seem stuck it's like sorry the focus got all over the place there but they they, they seem stuck on that um right bank we'll, we'll just call it passenger side bank for now and then when we come over here driver side bank you can hear them they're moving great so that is uh weird we're gonna go ahead and take all of them off we're gonna label them first we'll put a little bit of tape and we'll label them where they were on the engine we'll take them all off clean them run through them and make sure that they're operating the same way before we put them back on the vehicle. And we'll just, you know, give it another try. I have seen on uh, one of Matt Armstrong's videos, I think this throttle body's off also a uh, cross-reference part that they took from a Jaguar. So worst case scenario, it's probably a pretty cheap fix. I should never say that with a Lamborghini. <laughs> worst case scenario, this engine will never run right. But most likely scenarios, it's probably a cheap fix. Before we went into cleaning these things, I just had to show you guys, this is some pretty gnarly stuff. So, okay, so this is an example of one that was functioning. I can just put my finger in there and pop it right open like that. Very easy. And you can see, yes, there's <clears throat> definitely some corrosion around there, but it's not, it's not too bad. It is weird though. It must be a place where water wants to like sit or something, but it's, it's on the top and the bottom, which is, okay, it's just weird. We're gonna leave it at that. This one though is one of the stuck ones and holy moly, rust in a bunch of different places. But when I push on this thing, so top, top actuates the butterfly valve. When I push on this thing, it is just absolutely, well, I barely, I barely moved it a little bit. So um, we're gonna have to Google some sort of a good cleaning solution, a little CLR or something and get in here. But this, this was definitely stuck. There's no way the motors were moving this back and forth. Um, so this thing would have been causing a lot of issues. We'll definitely try our best to repair this before we look for a uh, replace solution. We started with CLR to kind of get some of the, uh, just like as a cleaner to try and get a little bit of the corrosion off. And then sandpaper in the long run was really the thing to get all the corrosion off. They're still pitting in the aluminum. These things were pretty rough, but to the touch, they are nice and smooth coming in. And then the blades were seized up because of rust. There's a chunk of something right here, get that out. The blades were uh, seized up because of rust. So we had to uh, use a little bit of um, penetrating oil and then we ended up lubricating with WD-40 and um, we got them all working, springing back, and uh, they look good. This would be a thing though, like if I could find replacements that were not a fortune, I'd still probably be buying replacements one of these, but I think they are gonna work for now. 
And uh, we would redo the wiring. I wanted to redo this wiring bundle in this loom, but we are out of uh, friction tape. So that is definitely put on the list though, because only one of these looms, this one's still good, but every other one is cracking and breaking and stuff, not in good shape. So um, some more work to do on the list, but we are in troubleshooting mode. So let's keep troubleshooting. We're gonna get these on the car. We're gonna put it into accessory mode and we're gonna actuate the pedal and see if the pedal um, drives these things so we can verify that the car can control them all properly. If not, we gotta do it with the car on, which is, hey, at least it's more exciting. All right guys, new throttle bodies, <laughs> new throttle bodies, I wish. Throttle bodies that are refurbished, refreshed, cleaned up, reworked. Unstickified. Unstickified. Yeah, good one, Oscar. Uh, they are in the car. Now, we're not sure if this is the type of car that when I put it in auxiliary mode and hit the throttle, if they're going to open and close or not, but we're going to find out. Okay, the car has decided to make a lot of new fun sounds that, um, and I'm, I'm saying fun quite sarcastically. One thing we got to remember to do is we have our codes that are all related to the throttle bodies. So let's go ahead and clear those codes so we can see if they're coming back. Okay, I'll, I'll let you guys hear the sound of. Oh. So loud! Oh my god! That was way too loud. Dude, I need. Can you give me some earplugs? <laughs> At first, it was like, oh, they're all gone. We're chill. And then, oh, oh no, that was so bad. It's so uncool for the car to go into car alarm mode when the key is in it. Like, and then you take the key out and it stops. Okay, so even though there aren't doors, I'm gonna hit unlock. Okay, unlock the car a few times. Hopefully that'll get the alarm to not be so mad. Okay, we're gonna turn the car on. We got earplugs in this time. All right, Oscar. Hey, that's so much better. It's chilled out a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna clear the codes. Codes are cleared. I'm gonna turn the car off and on one more time. All right, we've got a camera on one of the throttle bodies that was having trouble. And I'm gonna go fire this thing up. It's not gonna be a full throttle thing because it's not warmed up, but you know, we'll give it a... So last time we got the check engine lights come back on after a full cycle, so uh, they're clearly working. It sounds a lot better, it's actually revving up. It's not um, dropping the rev down where I'd like to see it. It's about 1,000 right now, which is high, but um, you know, it could be quirky Lamborghini things or it's, it is cold in here. So, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and fire it up one more time and let's see. One last test, just to be sure. working Murcielago. That is pretty cool. Now it sounds like a Murcielago. Sounds yeah. good. Might have been hard to track all my emotions there because getting out of that car I just was thinking like did we did we just do it? Like did we fix all the problems? And I and there's one in the back of my head that we're going to talk about in a second. We we have not yet fixed all the problems, but we are definitely going to try our damnedest to continue through this build with keeping the V12 keeping the gearbox, keeping everything powered by Lamborghini. I think we can pull it off, I'm pretty confident, but there is a big, big thing lurking that we, gotta, we still gotta fix, but I know, that, I know that we know how to fix it. It's just, well, anyways, we'll talk about it in a second. Oscar and I spent all day yesterday, um, now we're in a bit of a different gear. It's like, how many parts do we have? What do we have? Because you have to keep in mind, we plan these builds weeks, months, sometimes years in advance, and we get all the parts and the pieces ready so once we hit the ground, we can hit the ground running. I kind of pride myself on being pretty good at that. That's how we're able to build cars for SEMA in like 30 days is because we pretty much order an entire car and then we get building. So this car, we weren't planning on using the Lamborghini powertrain. We weren't planning on using the suspension, the uh, the wheels, the brakes and rotors, and all of these things, but I did purchase them with a lot, a lot of, or I did purchase this car with a lot, a lot of stuff to replace a lot of the broken stuff. 
Does that make sense? Let me show you around. So now we're looking at this car with a little bit of a different lens. We're saying, okay, now we're keeping, you know, all of the Lamborghini suspension. How much of it is gone? How bad is the damage in these different places, et cetera, et cetera. And um, luckily, Andrew, who uh, sold me this car, he did a really, really good job of documenting all of the parts that he took off and all the parts that he sent to us and that we purchased with the build. And that's really, really cool of him. So we're, we're in a pretty good spot. So here's something that we pulled out of storage. For instance, it's a front axle. Uh, we've been looking at suspension components, control arm components, knuckle components. Um, and we've just basically been cataloging everything that we need to get this thing back to OEM so we can run OEM suspension or OEM plus, you know, better things. And uh, it took about a day, but we're in a really good spot. And we have a really cool looking table full of Lambo stuff. So I'll, I'll, we're going to go over all this stuff when we rebuild it, um, officially rebuild it the right way. But this is just parts and pieces that we've been cataloging, looking at, seeing what needs to be fixed inside them, seeing what parts, like silly little things like this, this thing right here in my hand, seven that was in my hand, $750 from Lamborghini. This one, another $750 from Lamborghini. This thing right here, $1,250 from Lamborghini. Luckily, Andrew packaged all of these things up, probably pulled them off of existing broken stuff, like here's a broken knuckle that we have, and there's chunks of other broken knuckles around, and he made sure everything went with the vehicle to us, and by the time we unboxed everything, we're only out missing parts. Depends if you want to call it like used car prices or Lambo prices, but it's it's like less than five grand of stuff that we need to order to get this car, that, as far as what we know of right now, to get all the suspension, the brakes, everything back and working and ready to be a roller once again, to run and drive. It's less than five grand for sure. We're gonna do the BS for Buildway and we're gonna get creative and I think we're gonna land at probably around $2,000 or $1,500 kind of depends, probably closer to 2000. But one of the biggest things that we need to look at is this fuel cell. So our fuel cell got uh, very, very damaged in the wreck. And um, it's just, you know, as we've been working through here and figuring out what we need to do, we know we got to get rid of this fuel cell. So Oscar is going to jump into this now while I work on the computer and keep trying to source as many parts as we can. Bent piece of the frame right here, all the bent pieces of frame, none of the None of the pieces that are bent on the frame are important. I should mention that. None of them actually are going to affect things like suspension pickup points, and those are the important parts of a frame. So <laughs> um, we, none of those are bent, so that's great. Uh, but you can see like these supporting, some of these supporting things are bent, and this is a gas tank supporting arm right here, and that is bent. So it's gonna get cut off. We clean the surfaces, we measure the steel, we order new steel and build it. This is all built out of steel. It's all just square rail. It is the easiest stuff to construct a car with. We honestly don't build cars out of this stuff because it, it seems like too amateur style, but that's how Lamborghini did it. And if they did it that way, I'm sure it's good enough. But we would usually use tubes for something like this because they're stronger. Why didn't Lamborghini use tubes? It's easier. Because it's easier to not use tubes? <laughs> no bending, just cutting. <laughs> yeah, there's no bending. It's just cutting. I would never say Lamborghini took like the easy way out or the whatever, but yes, tubes would be... Maybe they did this honestly because they don't want it to just look like a race car chassis, which have always traditionally been built out of tubes. So they went with square steel, but in the newer cars, they upgraded all of this to bonded aluminum. It's either aluminum, big thick aluminum pieces built together, or it's bonded aluminum pieces and the Huracan and the Aventador. But in this car, square steel. So anyways, that's gonna get cut out and a lot of dirt is gonna get dug out here. You can see we're already, we're already getting into it. And Oscar's gonna go ahead and get this fuel cell out while keeping as much of this carbon quarter panel in place as we can. Although there ain't too much of it alive anymore, so.
Oscar got the fuel tank out and good news, everything around the fuel tank is still in great shape. So we're gonna be able to just swap in a new fuel tank and we're gonna have to weld in, before we do that, uh, a new arm, this lower arm that got bent. But other than that, everything is looking good. So that's, that's really, really awesome news. This is what our fuel tank looked like after the wreck. I mean, it's absolutely destroyed. We were able to find a replacement uh, fuel tank with just a small dent in it. It's just like basically tiny cosmetic damage for $700. So that's a really good price considering pretty much everything with Lambo costs a ton of money. So our new one won't come with the pumps. So we'll be taking these top hats off and, and pulling out the pumps. And in one of these pumps, there's also going to be the uh, fill level sending unit that's going to tell us how much uh, fuel we have in there. That has been giving us very weird readings. So we're going to have to diagnose that and either fix it or replace it or whatever. That's the fill where we fill the gas into and then um, the breather section. So that's the tank. The, another thing that we did as well is we ordered brand new rubber to insulate it against the frame because this rubber had gotten a little bit worn down. So there's going to be all brand new rubber coming in here. These straps, the metal on the straps is still good. It needs to be a little bit cleaned up and refinished, but the, this is like a kind of softer neoprene and we're going to be going for a harder, a little bit thicker, more robust rubber when we put it back in there so everything will be just a little bit better than when we took it out now at this point we've already committed to running this v12 this thing works and we are gonna make it work in this car that's 100 percent for sure but right now it's it's uh it's really not in a good way a couple days ago we discovered something that is pretty crazy and uh it could be a huge huge really hard fix or it could be a relatively easy fix and that's what we're about to find out but let me show you the problem then we'll talk about the solution when we first got underneath here, we started looking around and uh, it, it didn't jump out at us right away, but after a while we realized that the engine was looking a little bit low. And if you see that cross member right there, you can see that the engine looks suspiciously close to it. The engine and the trans is a lot of what we're looking at here. So that's the dry sump uh, kind of oil pickup point pan. Up there is the trans, back here is the rear diff. Diff is if it's not sitting on this cross member, it's too close. The engine, let's call it the front of the engine slash trans is sitting on that cross member and inside the car, it's tweaked to the side just a little bit. The impact was so severe. We're still not sure exactly how it impacted. I think it impacted probably careened off a road and then slammed down on its belly on the right side. So I'm guessing it went off the road, flew and smashed on its right side. So severe that it either shifted the engine within its mounts or bent the engine and transmission mounts are back here. So you got a diff mount that's right, right there. You can see when we look at this diff mount though, it's still straight. It's not bent, it's triangulated, everything looks good. So I'm hoping that stuff just shifted rather than actually bent. So in every production vehicle we've ever worked on, you've got, you've got an engine, bolted to that engine is gonna be an engine mount, then you should have a cushion, and then you got the frame and where it accepts the engine mount. All these things bolt together. Same with on a transmission, you've got the trans, trans mount, bushings, and then it bolts to the frame. So there's a lot of bolting going on there. With a large enough impact, those bolts could slip, they could shift because on an engine mount, usually you've got some weird vertical surfaces, so they're not bolting straight to metal. So they could shift, they could slip, and that could be why our engine is down. There could have been a large enough impact and it just like literally just shifted on its engine mounts. I've had it happen on builds before, and that could be why our engine is low. The other thing that it could be is that none of the things slipped or shifted and it just bent the frame where the engine mount is. Now, because this frame is all made out of steel, that's something that we can fix. We could just cut the engine mounts off, re-weld them on there, uh, right where they need to go and we could be back in business. We're gonna hope it's the first thing and hope that we can just loosen up a bunch of bolts, move the engine back to where it's supposed to be, tighten those bolts down and be back in business. As long as we don't crash it again, the engine shouldn't go anywhere. But if it's the other thing, it means we have to pull the entire engine out and fix it, which we are prepared to do and we have the knowledge. So we're gonna hope it's the easy one first though. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get our gantry, that's that big, uh, big arch looking thing. We're gonna bring that over the engine over here. We're gonna uh, strap up to the engine and we're gonna start taking the weight off of the car. And then um, we'll get underneath, undo all the bolts, and then we'll start trying to massage this engine around, engine and transmission and rear differential, and get them to move back into the spot where they belong. 
and hope that it's a situation where we can loosen the bolts, move everything back to where it's supposed to be and tighten them back up. If we find out that we loosen all the bolts and it really just doesn't go anywhere and it won't go up anymore and get away from the bad things, excuse me, then we know that the uh, frame is bent. The, the engine mounting frame section is bent and we have to pull the whole engine out. Let's hope it's not that. We've got the engine all rigged up. So the weight of the engine is on the hoist now coming up. Um, we took out some of the stuff here so we could see the exhaust. Now everything that bolts to the engine that then bolts to the car needs to be loosened up. So by my count, that's the rear differential. That's the engine mounts. That's the exhaust, transmission, and maybe stuff with the front differential. So Oscar and I are just gonna be running through here, finding every bolt that we can, loosen them all up, but leaving them in still, and uh, hoping that we can get a little bit of maneuverability back out of this engine. Discoveries have been made. We've got the engine in the right spot. We figured out why it had, the reason the engine was low had nothing to do with the crash. The reason the engine was low had something to do with bad mechanicking, which is honestly probably a worse thing to find in your Lamborghini that whoever was doing the servicing on it uh, was, a, you know, was, a, was a DIYer somewhat of a DIYer myself. We lifted the engine off of the engine mounts, we looked in the engine mounts, and we found this type of rubber. Now this type of rubber is like a butyl rubber. Um, it's, it's, it's deformed. It's good for sound deadening. It's good to make stuff like not squeak. It's not good for actually isolating. So the engine had no vertical um, engine mount isolation whatsoever. And I can pretty much guarantee to you that that was that way from the previous driver and they were just driving around like that. So they're missing about a quarter inch of engine mount. No worry, I have a 3D printer. I have thermal parpolurethane. I got TPU, which is rubber, it's 3D printable rubber. I'm gonna design a, uh, a vertical engine mount isolator. All the horizontal or all the directionals to do horizontal isolation, that's still working perfectly. It just doesn't have any cushion up to down, which then let the engine sink down a little bit too far. So I'll print out, uh, it's gonna look like a hockey puck with a hole in it. It's gonna have a middle isolation section, squish section, not isolation, and it's gonna be awesome. And then we'll slide it in there and then when we bolt everything back up, everything will be perfect. All right, we got our new engine mounts made up. We're gonna go ahead and get these things in the car, get the engine laid back down on its own weight and double check our clearances. This was such a cool fix. I am so happy we were able to get this without pulling the engine. And it's kind of like awesome that we were able to just keep it all in house and bust it out in the 3D printer as well. Let me show you around with the new fix. It's a little hard to see, but you can see that like that, that bar is definitely a lot further away than it was before. And um, well, yeah, it's in a good spot. Here's another reason, or here's one of the easiest ones to see is right in here. This CV was sitting on the frame and now it's got its good like quarter inch plus of clearance. So that's great. And the engine is once again on a real engine mount. I was very, very worried that in the beginning of this, that the Lamborghini was gonna do Lamborghini things and we wouldn't be able to just apply kind of standard hardware applications to be able to fix this car and that software would get in the way of us having fun and being able to bring the V12 back to life. Turns out all the problems were with just basic hardware. The software is still being cool as of right now. And I'm really getting a good vibe from this car. I, I always feel like cars can kind of like tell you what they want done and kind of, I feel like it almost kind of steers you in the right way in some, in some weird way. And I think this car is 
getting happier and happier with us doing improvements. So, um, although we pulled the fuel cell out, so we can't drive it for a little bit until we get the fuel cell and a lot of other stuff. It's now sitting in a better way than it ever has been. And that is a fully functional, no check engine lights anymore. No, no issues that we know of Lamborghini V12. So that is really, really exciting. Yeah, Oscar did point out, yeah, the fuel lines are disconnected, but that's temporary. We've got all the parts that we need coming. They're on the way. I feel like it's not gonna be too much money, but you're gonna just have to watch the rest of this series to find out. So that's your reminder to make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any more videos on us restoring this thing. This is the direction that the build is going. This is gonna be a V12 powered Lamborghini Murcielago, and we're doing a restoration. Thank you guys so much for watching. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys on the next one. Peace.